episode, we'll be looking at humidity. Now, humidity is the amount of water vapor in a particular region of the atmosphere. Air has the ability to hold water vapor, but that's highly dependent on its temperature. For this video, we'll be referring to that ability to hold water vapor as capacity. Let's compare cold air to warm air. As we've been talking about, cold air has a higher density and a higher pressure than warm air. Because of this, when we look at warm air, there's a lot more space between the air molecules. So in comes water vapor, there's room for it to fit between the spaces. So therefore, warm air has a higher capacity. Cold air, on the other hand, does not. Because the molecules are closer together, it cannot hold as much water vapor. So in comparing the air temperature to the moisture holding ability of air, as air temperature increases, so does its ability to hold moisture. This is a direct relationship. On a typical weather report, humidity is actually given in a percentage. This is known as the relative humidity. Relative humidity is a ratio of the air's actual water vapor content compared with the amount of water vapor required for saturation at that temperature. Now, saturation simply means can't hold any more water. To give you an analogy of this, Let's use drinking glasses. So here I have an empty drinking glass. It has no water in it, but it has a 100% capacity to hold water. In this situation, the relative humidity would be zero because it still has its full capacity. In this example, we have 50% full of water in this drinking glass, but it has 50% capacity left. Therefore, its relative humidity in this situation would be 50% because it still has 50% more capacity. In my last example, I'm at 80% full and a 20% capacity. So I would say that the relative humidity here would be 80% because there's still room for more water vapor and it's a comparison between the two. So let's look at a similar analogy. Again, using containers to show warm air and cold air, the warm air has a much bigger capacity than the cold air. So if I add water to my warm air, I'm still not close to being full. If I add water to my cold air, I'm much closer to being saturated. So changing the temperature of the air affects the relative humidity. Let's take a look at how that works on a daily basis. If we were to look at relative humidity and air temperature for a, a typical day, they are opposite of one another. In the morning, relative humidity is relatively high. That's because air temperature is low. Lower air temperature means the air is more condensed and uh, therefore holds less water vapor. What that really means is it's at its capacity. It can't hold that much to begin with because it's cool or colder. Therefore, it's got a higher relative humidity as a result. Later on in the day, as the air temperature increases, the relative humidity goes down. The higher the air temperature, the more the air is expanding and rising, leaving room for more water vapor to be held. And now if the water if the air is actually less filled because it's got a greater capacity, the relative humidity goes down. If I wanted to change relative humidity, I could do so by adding more water vapor. Notice in this example I have four beakers, they're all the same size. So my temperature is going to be the same. But if I just add more water vapor, so I'm adding more water droplets, I can increase relative humidity. That means the temperature is the same, but I'm putting more water into the atmosphere. Now, when does that happen? 
typically happens over large bodies of water because wa water has a relatively stable temperature throughout the day because of its high specific heat, the evaporation effect from the sun is going to pump water into the surrounding air. So the temperature is going to stay the same in the air, but you're going to get more water vapor being added. So that's one way to change relative humidity. So graphically, if I increase the amount of water added to the air while keeping the temperature the same, I will increase my relative humidity. The other way to change relative humidity is to change the temperature, as we've been talking about. Well, in this example, I have six water droplets in my big beaker, so I have really warm air, lots of room left. If I cool the air down, the next beaker, the middle beaker, those six water droplets fill the beaker with very little room left. Now, if I take those six water droplets and I add them to my smallest beaker, my colder air, now I've run out of room. And what that means is now the water vapor goes from being held in the air to spilling out, which winds up being precipitation. So cooling the air down will also increase the relative humidity. And that's a far more common process because as air rises up into the atmosphere, it's getting cooler. And the cooler it gets, the more saturated the air becomes, and it causes the water vapor to condense, which is what causes clouds or forms clouds. So as air temperature increases, my relative humidity decreases, as we've been talking about. To measure humidity, we use two devices. One is called a hygrometer, which we won't use. The other is called a psychrometer, and a psychrometer is a device that we will actually get a chance to look at in class, and it works like this. Using a psychrometer involves two different thermometers. One is called a wet bowl, and the other is called a dry bowl. I'll explain more. The wet bulb is actually moistened. It's wet with water, and it measures the rate of evaporation in degrees. The more water that evaporates from the wet bulb, the lower the temperature will be. The dry bulb is simply sampling the air. This is what a psychrometer looks like in real time. There's the wet bulb, typical thermometer. The other thermometer attached is the dry bulb, also a typical thermometer. Notice they both have the same reading currently. The wet bulb is moistened, dri dipped in water, and wrung out slightly so it's not dripping. And using the pivot point, there's a stick attached to these thermometers, we're going to sling it. It's actually called a sling psychrometer. So slinging it means basically spinning it. And by spinning it, you're exposing it to the air. And you do it for about five minutes. And what this does is, it samples the air in terms of the dry bulb and the wet bulb. After doing this, we look at the difference between the two thermometers. If there's a large difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb, that means the air is dry or the humidity is low. In other words, the rate of evaporation from the wet bulb was pretty good because the air can accept a lot of water vapor. Therefore, the air is pretty dry because it's accepting of water vapor. The opposite situation would be if the dry bulb and the wet bulb were close in value. That means the water isn't evaporating from the wet bulb and therefore the air is actually pretty saturated and already has a high humidity. And we can say, and we'll learn about this soon, that the air temperature is close to the dew point. And that's an indicator that the humidity is high and we are looking at incoming conditions that may bring precipitation or cloudy weather. In our last video, we explored relative humidity, and this is a follow-up to that because dew point is closely related to the humidity of air. A typical weather report will tell you the dew point because it is the temperature at which dew forms. Dew are those tiny, drop, tiny droplets of water that form on the grass or surfaces uh, somewhere between late spring, early summer, when the air is cool enough at night to condense the water vapor and form on surfaces. The dew point temperature is the temperature 
that air would need to be cooled to reach saturation. As we talked about in the humidity video, uh, saturation means filled to capacity. It can't hold any more. So if we cool air below the dew point, if we drop temperature of air below the dew point temperature, this is going to cause water vapor to condense, and that leads to clouds, that can lead to fog, and that can lead to, obviously, dew. And although the dew point is similar to relative humidity, it's a better measurement of the actual moisture content of the air. That's why it's more commonly used on weather maps and weather reports. Generally speaking, the higher the dew point temperature, that means the air is relatively moist. Lower dew point temperatures will mean dry air. So on this weather map, these are our current temperatures for uh, the United States. And if I compare these temperatures to the dew point, wherever the two numbers are close, then we're dealing with humid conditions. So when dew point temperature matches air temperature, that's saying the air temperature has reached a point that the air is saturated. Most of those locations occur in the southeast and the southwest because those are the more humid areas. So if I take the original dew, uh, air, air temperature map and I overlay the dew point temperature, we can kind of see where the numbers are the same. Okay, And where the numbers are most similar, as I already said, are in the southeast and the southwest. And on this particular day, if I looked at the surface conditions, the Doppler radar, the places where there's precipitation, actual rain events going on, they're associated with those locations where the dew point and the air temperature meet are, are the same or close to being the same. So once again, dew point measures how much water vapor is in the air. And the more water vapor that's in the air, the higher the dew point temperature will be.